Welcome back to Crosstalks. As a result of extreme urbanization in the 20th century, half of the world's populations now live in cities. About a century and a half from now, that will be true for 98% of humanity. Traditionally viewed as sites of industrialization, pollution, and a breakdown of social bonds, cities are also centers of culture, opportunity, social change, and innovation. Which view of the city will prove to be truer in the decades, of come, decades to come? Will the solutions to the world's problems of poverty and environmental dis destruction be found in the urban areas? And is it even possible to design for specific outcomes in a complex world? How much does planning today close off innovation and new solutions in the future? With me to discuss the ethics and practice of the urban phase of globalization are Andrew Byerly, researcher at the Department of Human Geography here at Stockholm University and also at the Nordic, Nordic Africa Institute at Uppsala University. Welcome. Thank you. Katja Grillner is professor in critical studies in architecture at the KTH Royal Institute of Technology. Welcome. And Tommy Jensen is a professor in management, organization and society at Stockholm University. Welcome. Joining us on Skype is Professor Ash Amin, the professor of geography at Cambridge University. Welcome to Crosstalks. Thank you. Um, Andrew Byerly, your research is within colonial and post-colonial spatial planning, architecture and urban housing, housing in Africa. What are some specific urban challenges uh, in, let's say, two of the countries that you've focused on, Uganda and Namibia? Yeah, I would just start by saying that uh, when we're talking about Africa, often there's uh, this kind of idea that uh, it's, it's talked about in terms of being a patient almost. Uh, ten years ago, it would be, be seen as being almost a dying patient in the respect of the chaos, perceived chaos, uh, almost cam cannibalistic nature of the city in Africa. Uh, more recently, there's been a more a positive, uh, uh, we call it Afro-optimism, or that's the time it's been given uh, in the debate. Uh, one example of it, some of you may have seen this Jen Zassur photographic exhibition at uh, Lilia Walsh recently, which is a specific um, intervention to say that uh, you know, there are positive things happening in the African continent. Um, myself and my research team, along with many others uh, in this research field, uh, try and present a more balanced view, uh, which maybe doesn't have this um, over-optimism or over uh, dystopian view of the African city. Um, as your introduction said, I'm doing most of my work in Uganda and Namibia. I won't deepen uh, specific cases really. I'll just take a few cases, few, few uh, processes maybe which are, are on the agenda today. Uh, the first one, which cannot be avoided when talking about the African cities, is this question of informality, uh, i.e. the idea that both um, provision of services, housing, water, garbage, collection, etc. In, in many cases, has to be organized by people themselves in their communities. Um, the second feature of informality is that many people are not in formal sector work, uh, which per se means that the amount of income coming into the state, uh, the city municipalities from taxes, is very small. So there we have a, a, almost a, a catch-22 situation uh, where there's very little money in circulation for uh, intervening in urban areas to improve uh, sanitation, infrastructure, and so on. Uh, and secondly, people on very low incomes. So I would st stress the point of informality. Mm. Uh, I'll take up maybe one, one more issue to start with, and this is this question of, of neoliberal uh, urban governance, which basically means a, a shift from, for example, state provision of services and uh, housing, for exam example, to more uh, market-led um, uh, provision of, of such, such services. Uh, what we're seeing in many of the big cities in Africa at the moment, I've, I see it myself in Kampala, um, is uh, cases where many cities are trying to present themselves as, as successful um, uh, modern cities to the outside world with the hope that this will attract tourists, cap flows of capital, etc. Mm. Uh, so we see sudden transformations of central, central areas of many cities on the African continent. What we're looking at in our research is this question of displacement, uh, marginal groups who become classed or discursively um, talked about as being um, unwanted in these sort of uh, successful central uh, districts. Mm. Uh, so those two issues I would, I would bring up to start with at least. Uh, Kati Grillner, your work on architecture and power has focused particularly on, on gender hierarchies. I, I realize this is a vast question, but, but in what ways can physical structures reflect societal structures? 
Um, yeah, to begin with, I mean, yes, it's a vast uh, question, but I think it's also interesting to respond to in a, in a quite basic way, so that we understand how how um, how the city, the built environment as such, through its buildings, streets, parks, and so forth, what we see in Stockholm, for example, is where we are, how that uh, tells us stories about the society in which we live, and also, of course, of the past. Uh, in very simple ways, so that, for example, if we have a city uh, where we have uh, very high-quality parks, we have provision of spaces for children, for leisure, it's all kept in a very sort of good way, it tells something about that society and what society uh, cares for. It, cares, it tells also about perhaps affluence, about resources to care in that sense. And uh, also, I think it's interesting to think about this question in terms of how you can then locate differences, perhaps, in the, within the same city. If you take a bus line uh, through the city and you start to look at how, how are the bus stops kept here, and how are the bus stops kept here, and what are the, are, are the lamps working, are they like, uh, what's the quality of urban space? Is the park uh, neglected, or is it actually very well kept? And that also, if you look through those kind of public provisions on, on the city and make those journeys, you also can... S and if there are big differences in this, that also tells something about the current society, about the public responsibility and who's important, who's not important, I, and so forth. I, I do see how that's connected to power, but it's a little bit unclear to me, actually. I mean, I, even as a feminist, how that is connected to gender. Ah, uh, uh, to... To well, now you asked about the society yeah. and, uh, and, and the built environment. So, but how do we apply that? How, what if would we be... think? Uh, yes. So, I mean, if you if you think through, okay, so what what would a city be like then if there is a kind of gender conscious uh, planning department mm. uh, there? Uh, and I think to to look at that, I think you can you can look at that from like maybe I would respond in two uh, in two major ways. One is the kind of very simple way to actually start to think about what is the gendered spaces in this context. Mm. Is it so uh, in this place and time that soccer fields, for example, are very uh, male spaces? So there are the little boys and there are the young men and so forth. Are they dominated by that? Is it so that uh, the playgrounds in this particular society in this time is very dominated by mothers with children and so forth? How do we care to the, for these different spaces? How how much money, in very simple terms, do we put in them? How much care? How much? That tells us something about how we provide for, for the society. If we look at it with gendered glasses, and we can look in many other ways on it. So that's very, one very simple way. And, but at the same time, that, that nice <laughs> and gender-conscious planning department also needs to be, of course, questioning these norms. OK. Um, how, how is it that these soccer fields are filled with little boys and not so many girls and so forth? How can we provide and think through planning so we can transform this and, nem and uh, bend norms? And for that, we need feminists, or we can use, make use of feminist theory, which is what we do in our research and teaching to actually train future architects to, to understand how, how they might work and how they might such sort of gender-conscious planning departments, and that can make change. Yeah. Uh, so it can be both very simple about numbers, but also it's very important to also be transformative and progressive in this. All right. Now we've heard of two very different uh, approaches. Professor Ashamin, so what could maybe... Now I realize I'm simplifying a lot by calling this a post-colonial approach, but the feminist narrative or a post-colonial reading of, of cities could perhaps be useful strategies towards breaking out of something that you call telescopic urbanism. Could you describe to us what that term means? Yes, of course. Um, t telescopic urbanism is a concept that, that uh, I think describes our urban condition rather well today. You know, we live in cities which are never-ending, which are increasing in terms of population size. And there are also cities in which the elites of the cities want to now um, find their place in the sun by becoming globalized and by doing all sorts of things that essentially disconnect them from the rest of the city. Which is why I coined this phrase telescopic urbanism, which is a way of saying that today um, the different parts of the city 
don't come together, and particularly city governors, city planners, and city elites, don't want to have anything to do with other parts of the city, particularly the places where the poor live. So in this kind of context, I agree with you, post-colonial and feminist readings are very, very helpful because what they do is they offer us a critique of power, um, particularly by showing the nature of the connections between different parts of the city, different uh, social cl classes and groups through the labor market, for example, and they give you that textured, situated feel of what goes in a city. So this, as I said, the critique of power is very, very important. But I think there are also some limitations because today what we need more than anything else in the context of that huge city that's the invisible city is a science which allows us to see the city as a whole. It's a science that allows us to look at the infrastructures that snake through the city. Is a optic that helps us to see the city in its entirety, whether it is Stockholm or Bangkok or, or London, so that we begin to see all the interconnections and the interdependencies, to use the example I gave you mm -hmm. before, between, let us say, the rich and the poor, between the elites and the migrants who come to the city. I wonder, though, what academia realistically... I mean, I almost said contribute, and I, I do realize the, the thinking and the analysis is incredibly important, and a structured critique is very important, but can that actually change something? It does seem to me that, that economic and political power is elsewhere, and perhaps the wielders of that power are not very interested in, in alternative and maybe more holistic approaches. Well, there's a paradox there. I mean, the orthodoxy comes by wearing holistic thinking on its sleeve. So, for instance, if you think about what neoliberal thinking is all about, it effectively says, you know, markets are good for everything. The state is not good for anything. It, ac it accepts the, the flows of the times. It accepts inequality. So the orthodoxy is extremely, is fantastic at holistic thinking. It doesn't, it doesn't like difference. It doesn't like nuance. It doesn't like critique. So what I think uh, the, the, the injunction, the challenge for us who find ourselves on the critical side of thinking is, is exactly as you say, it's not so much just to offer yet more critique, but to offer alternative holistic paradigms of the good society, of the good city. Mm. Um, to, yes, to speak truth to power, but also to begin to offer new utopian visions of the city which tap into people's everyday and real concerns and build new structures of feeling, new positive emotions about living in the integrated, uh, sustainable city for women, for children, and so on and so forth. And, mm. you know, that's where I wouldn't be so uh, dismissive of, of what academics can do because if academics are not involved in working with, let us say, visionaries and politicians to, to develop new utopias, then who is? Yes. Tommy Jensen, it, it, it seems to me that what we're talking about here is, is uh, or a great part of it, is a conflict of interest between the public and the private spheres. In your work on globalization, you're tracking the same conflict on national and international levels. So I guess what I'm asking is, to what degree are local or everyday issues, for me as a city dweller, connected to these global trends? I would say that um, my worry about the connection is that we have a lack of democratic dialogues. Um, on a global level, we, we see how the stakes and who holds the stakes on a global level are shrinking and who are allowed into the communication and, and to allow to have a voice about urban planning and about many issues. And I would say that in a city environment as Stockholm, we face the same problems. Um, um, globalization is a buzzword, but whose globalization are we talking about? And, and um, on a, a micro level, on a city environment, as we have been discussing here, we can take an issue of a park bench. Why is it there? For whom is it there? Um, if we, I mean, at Wooden Plan, I, I think the park, park bench will be a little bit of a slope. Why? Because we moving people are supposed to sit there for a while. But more stationary people as homeless, they shouldn't 
be, be there to sit there. So it has to have a slope so they glide off. So we design, we design things to, 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 to put boundaries between people and class, gender, ethnicity, and, and so on. And there's, of course, a side effect of that is that you're also then designing a square where nobody wants to sit and read a book, for instance, mm -hmm. or, or stay for, for a longer period of time, which would require a normal bench, bench in daytime. Yeah, yeah, and I would also say that, yeah. that for instance, there are other issues here um, in the urban space. Where are we allowed to to, to both participate in commercial activities and political. Mm. I mean, the urban space is more getting commercial. Mm. We are supposed to do some shopping and stuff and move around, and, and, and we have, don't have this you know, political space. Andrew? Yeah, I'll just add on to that. I totally agree with what you say, but also this question of democracy and what democracy should mean. Um, I mean, there's a lot of work recently by you know, Chantal Mouffe uh, saying that uh, you know, we should have some friction left in the city um, to debate around how the city should be formed. And um, for my research in Stockholm, which is also about park benches, funny <laughs> enough, um, um, you know, we see, uh, you know, there is, for example, a park bench um, employee at the city council who can go in uh, unilaterally and take away park benches if there's supposedly friction between different groups there. So instead of um, taking away friction, I think a positive idea would be to have some friction left there so people can actually discuss uh, and talk around these issues instead of having these sort of clampdowns on, on um, you know, what should and shouldn't be in the city. I'm astonished to hear that we have a park bench czar in Stockholm. I mean, I, mean, I know I sound glib, like, like that this mm. is a trivial issue. It's not for the users not, of the no. park benches at all. Yeah. But this does raise the, the, the question that was mentioned briefly before, the good city, the, the idea... Of the, of the good city. So I guess I first I should ask you all if there is some kind of consensus on, on it within the, the wider academic community of what a good city is. No? Okay, no, then, then not, let's go I with think, individual I approaches. Say, uh, I mean, from, from my point of, of view, uh, the idea of the good city and, and discussions that kind of discussions that frame the good city as a goal, I think they're kind of dangerous discussions. Oh, the idea that there would be such a thing as, as a good city, because that kind of goodness, the goodness of the good, so to say, um, frames an understanding of a, a complete, uh, that is beyond difference, that you know, there is a good city for all, and that ideal takes away friction, it takes away difference, and so forth. So I would say that the good city concept is a very dangerous concept. Mm -hmm. Professor Ashamin. I think I want to disagree with that, um, particularly in the present context in which um, difference in so many cities is an excuse to uh, give minorities and vulnerable people a really, really tough time. And, and I think retaining some notion, not so much of the universally good city that which does exactly the same for everybody else, it's not, not a sense of sameness, but I mean, in a piece that I wrote a few years ago, I, I said that a, a good city w might respond to four R's, you know, not S's, but R's. A city, a good city is one that absolutely recognizes people's rights. A good city has extremely good systems of repair and maintenance. A good city is one that really believes, following the philosophy of, of difference, uh, uh, creates spaces for recognition. And then finally, a good city is one that is able to bounce back from uh, problems. It's a resilient city. Mm. Now, all these four things don't necessarily mean that you, you move towards a, a consensus city, that no, no. Uh, you, you wipe out agonism. Yeah. What you do is that these are conditions for agonism. No, but of course, of course. If you, if you think through and define a good city as that, that's not, um, that's not what I mean. But it has been used, certainly in a Swedish context, very much, I would say, as, as a concept that is more of the oppressive kind. Uh, Perhaps the, historically it's, it's been more of a... That there has been some kind of... I'm fumbling a little here, but a, a modernist project, let's say, of, of, of building the universal good city, mm. in a way. And that's, that's being challenged... It's no, not only that, at least but it's also it's it's a, it's a more modern time, modern than the modern that I'm meaning. That it's a, in perhaps it's it's a bit of a Swedishness, a Swedish context. That it's a way to to um, shield, um, um, and I would say difference in maybe in a different way. But it's a way to think that um, it's about norm, 
Yeah, that's, that's the thing. That the goodness of the good city is very much the goodness for the norm. Mm. And that we can all live up to that norm and be that norm. And in that connection. Yeah. So I, I certainly agree with what you are talking about as a good city. It's a different kind of good city. Ashamin. Can I just come back to that very quickly? Yeah. I, I agree with that. I think to try and define the good city normatively is very, very problematic because my norms are not your norms. But you know, just consider one thing. That within the next 20 odd years, some 3 billion people, not million, 3 billion people will be living in shanty towns around the world. Um, if you don't have a notion of the good city to help uh, improve the conditions of these three billion people, for instance, uh, a language of you know, rights towards, uh, for, to in infrastructure and to water and even your park benches, then it's inconceivable that uh, the needs of such a vast uh, size of population around the world will ever be met. Tommy, you, you argued that globalization changes the importance of time and space. I thought it was beautiful, but I don't quite understand it. So could you elaborate on how geography has an ethical dimension? Well, if I live a normal, ordinary day, I, I affect people that I will never see. I will not know where they are. For instance, I drink a, drink a cup of coffee. Um, by doing that, I belong to a, a chain of events that could be... Um, contributing to structural injustice uh, and envir environmental problems. And the, the thing when I say geof geography matters is that while living one day, we, we sort of take things for in, for, as given, uh, as granted in, in a city like, like Stockholm. The, all the resources are there. But you know, if you look at the planetary level, we have, have a lot of resources that are scarce, environmental resources and so on. And so I think the... the um, the challenge is to, to, to learn how to see how I affect people far, far away just by drinking a cup of coffee. It has been, you know, in, probably if we are in Sweden, it's to come from Brazil and we can have more or less draconian working conditions. We have a number of pesticides that go into this little bean and it's transported to Sweden and it's in the shop and I take it and it comes out from my body. It's, mm -hmm. it's a long chain of, you know, and this has made things more complicated. And, and I don't think coffee we... Of course, sorry, yeah. I, I, it has been, it, it is more complicated uh, for us human beings to, to act responsible. And take that, for instance, we have to take concern of not born generations, that's it. What I do today will affect my daughter's daughter in 40 years' time. My I, daughter I, is 14, so, I mean, that's, that's a an, an, an huge ethical, ethical challenge for me. I really like the, the example of coffee, actually, because it's also, of course, culturally so connected to, to urban ideas, to, to ideas of, 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 of quality urban mm. environments and certain kinds of lifestyles in, in, oh, for 300 years now, now in, in, northern, in northern Europe. So, uh, so, so, so there's, it, the specificness of that becomes, um, is very powerful. At the same time, I, I, I hear what you say, and then I think of the three billion people in the shanty towns that I'm contributing to by having this, this approved normative lifestyle where I currently live, and I just feel paralyzed. I have no tools to, uh, to even start to think about my city or, the, or theirs. So, so where, do we, where do we start unraveling this? Too hard? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I would start by admitting that different actors have, have different responsibilities uh, and start the discussion from there. I, I just yeah. dig where I stand. Mm. So, so, so I can do an analysis um, of my own life and in what way I do contribute to injustice or environmental um, uh, damages and so on. And when I talk to students, I, I, I often encourage them to start little. Mm. Because if you, if you think about the coffee cup, and you, then you can move on and think about the shirt, and then you can move on to, to at then come to the car. And, and then, you know, we have some problems on this with the environmental. It's, it's meat, it's housing, energy, and it's cars. Mm. Mm. No, I think also that's very important. Uh, the, um, to understand that you yeah, to start little, but and to 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 not be afraid of the awareness, uh, and also to realize that you you cannot have this dream of being able to. 
to, to do the good on all the levels because you're completely implicit in all this. But at the same time, so if you, if you can at least understand what's happening, you can also take some critical positions. You can't fix everything in one, but to, 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 to be able to live with that, but also understand, I think that's Tommy. very good. And here I think a, a live discussion, a, a live, lively discussion between a lot of, of different um, stakeholders is really important because everyday living in a city conceals this. Mm. It hides these um, structures of injustice and environmental problems. In the Stockholm, we live in, in affluency. We don't, we, don't, we don't see beyond things. So if we're moving in a direction where, where shanty towns will grow, another way of saying that is that informal cities then will become more usual, and indeed normal would be maybe even a word there. Um, what does that mean? What does that mean for the other kind of, other kind of city? Or is, is, is there any likelihood that, that capitals in, in industrialized nations will also move in a more informal direction, Andrew? I think um, <clears throat> the question of informality, um, you know, the, well, going back to your question before about, uh, you know, the good city um, and whether it's a good idea to formulate, you know, uh, manifestos or, or whatever, uh, I think the problem in, in the global south, at least, is that uh, they tend to despite good intentions, to often um, uh, become uh, concentrated to fix all uh, through very simple means. For example, microfinance for a few years was, was, was all the rage. This was going to solve all the problems. It was the United Nations microfinance year, I think in 2005 or 2006. Uh, now one of the big dominant ideas is formalization, and that's the exact idea is to... It really goes back to the work of uh, De Soto, really, this idea that there is a lot of capital in the informal, uh, informal city, uh, and the idea is to how to turn dead capital into liquid capital. Uh, and the idea there is that you formalise, you give these people rights which are um, you know, legally binding. Um, and, for example, in cities like Dar es Salaam, you know, we see huge projects of formalisation of the informal city. Um, but again, without overgeneralizing, the effect of that is that the people that uh, are going to be formalized and have better houses often can't afford what's being built instead mm -hmm. and are displaced again. Mm -hmm. So we see this all, always this, um, and it goes back, you can read um, you know, Engels' work from the 1800s again, and, and the, you can still see a lot going on, <laughs> which was going on then. Mm -hmm. Not much seems to have changed. Ashamin. Just on that specific point, I mean, uh, you, you know, we could conjecture a thought that both within the north and the south, the, the, the drift uh, seems to be towards increasing forms of informalization. So, you know, in both the north and the south, underneath the formal sector, you get all forms of informal practices, either domestic labor in the west or the kind of informal economies that Andrew's been alluding to. So the so what follows from that is well what's the nature of the problem is is it is it the balance between the formal and the informal, or is it that informality is a concealed world it's a concealed space in all in in which all kinds of let's call it unhappy uh, injustices uh, pass by without any form of uh, response from anybody, um, and for me I think that's the key issue here. It, it, it's what informality conceals rather than informality in its own terms. And let me just give you an example. Mm. Back, to the, back to Slum City, um, some countries around the world, the Latin American countries in particular, have been exceptionally good at intervening in the so-called informal sector, in the informal lives of slums, by giving them uh, all kinds of uh, ac access to all sorts of infrastructures, like, like water and electricity. And at that point, these slums continue to remain informal settlements, but they've become info informal settlements in which things are being made visible and in which certain needs are being met through the state or even through kind of informal community practices. That's the issue for me. You know, what you do about these things, not, not, not the balance itself. Mm. The, perhaps this is a very childish reflection, but I think a lot of people who are living in, in, in very... Um, in cities that that are where the public spaces, for instance, are are very controlled by 
capitalist structures do feel a, a sort of yearning for increased informality, and, and not just in, in, in the shape of, of grey labour, but also in uh, play in public spaces and under the undermining of, of those kinds of... of um, of, of binding structures, sort of that the, 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 there's a point where formality becomes the enemy of freedom. Mm. So there seems to be some kind of some, some some kind of scale where everybody would like to move towards the middle. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a it's a balance between uh, I think it was Richard Sennett that said a few, a few decades ago this, this balance of openness and order. You know that you know my views changed a little bit after I had children. You know before I was more this sort of radical idea that everything should go and. You know, this, the public spaces should be places of, of, of dynamic creativity and uh, you name it. Uh, but you notice, I mean, it's a life course amongst, in yourself as a researcher as well, seeing how your, your views change on that balance between order and openness, yeah. Um, and we're researching a big public park in Stockholm where there's a lot of friction going on between different groups there. Uh, and I can see how my views today are very different from they were would have been five years ago. Um, so it's a different question even within oneself on how you should pitch this balance between openness and order and how you resolve uh, friction that comes up from different views on that. So that seems to be central. Yes, no, I, I, mean, I, I agree. But I, I would say that um, Stockholm is a city that is uh, moving uh, has more and more towards this, this uh, quite extreme formalization of public space and the commercialization and where where if there were ever any pockets in the inner city of kind of wilderness and so forth, it's like it's being uh, closed off. And I would say then it's going, um, it's going very far towards what actually doesn't, where you cannot, you cannot appropriate space, you cannot, you, you cannot do anything but what is expected. And that, I think, is quite uh, problematic and oppressive. Uh, uh, because it also relates, if this is just a physical space, and what the physical space does to your instinct, it kind of says something also about how you're supposed to act in society and what kind of initiatives you're supposed to take. And so I think it has... Um, um, it, 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 is, it is quite important, really. That, uh, it's almost like, you, that, like what you're saying is that, that there are two... Also, two competing visions of the city mm -hmm. are also mm -hmm. the city as a continuous process, which is always uh, alive and a site of creativity and mm -hmm. a site of social change and innovation mm -hmm. and all that. And, and, and the other view would be as a sit the city of something that can be finished. Mm. But also, that is, uh, it, it also relates back to this good city ideal that if you, if you have a city where you need to tilt the benches so that the homeless doesn't stay, where you have to, where you say that the park that is a bit wilder, that perhaps the youth are uh, making out in the evenings and there are some beer cans, so that when that becomes something that you cannot see, you cannot have, uh, but you still have it. Mm -hmm. So it's all about shielding over and really making like that we have the perfect society, but it's, but of course it's never there and what, we have a, home, a place for uh, transient living from, for homeless who it shouldn't be in the center of city, so you move it out. So that kind of moving out and, and glossing over you make the makeup of the city, so to say. And that relates then to this bad, good city. Tommy. I think there's an interesting paradox between um, what different um, people say, or, or those who, who rule the city management or govern, you know, take control of things and try to govern or, and manage the city. They often display that as a sort of mobility and freedom. That's on the one hand. So they try to design cities so we can, you know, have mobile and, and free lives. But on the other hand, I think it's easy to say what is not so good with cities. Uh, we, we design cities more and more after after cars. So from an environmental perspe perspective, that would be devastating. So in, in the name of you know, freedom of choice, I take my children and I say, that school two miles over there is best for my child. And I, then I take the mm. child there. And then we arrange uh, cities, uh, places where I'm supposed to shop, by car, of course. And then I have other places when I go to work. So we have this kind of activities that are rewarded, that sort of shape the city. And that's often in the name of freedom, I guess. But in terms of, of environmental impact, it's devastating. But, but, but we also see a city, sorry, but we also see a city that is segregated. Mm. When certain people are forced to move at certain places because they cannot 
be as mobile as, for instance, I can, at least in, in, in uh, Western urban areas. So the, the, what worries me about this is that, of course, the, the cities that we live in now are very much the result of lifestyle choices and planning decisions from decades ago, and including, really, the dominance of cars. Now it's... Now that's the society we live in, and that's why we build for even more cars. But we would have wanted, we would have needed somebody to think different a few decades ago. So, I'm going to raise now the question uh, before we move to questions: what, what are the cities of the future? Is it possible to answer this? Is it different in the north and the south? And is it something we can plan for, or is it something that has already happened? Let's start with Ashamin. <clears throat> well, um, if you accept that cities are uh, living evolving places, then there's, a, there's quite a major planning issue that arises. The cities will develop in their, of their own momentum, come what may. Mm. Um, I mean, that, that's the history of urbanism. And whereas in the past, I think, planning in inverted commas, a good city through the modernist tradition was very top down through large scale engineering of the good life, which became the bad life. I don't think you can do that today anymore, okay? because the city has become a living process. And it is such a complex, and as I said before, a hidden process, that you can't really... The only thing you can do is the politics of adjustment. Mm. So for me, the real issue there is that, well, who does the adjusting here? And I think Tommy made a very interesting observation earlier on, which was, which was this, that... If the adjusting is done by elites who have a particular reference point, which is to make a city a global city, globally competitive, a nice place for consumption, and kill almost everything else that moves, you know, then that, that's a bad planning decision. But, but if, as, as we take up what Tommy was suggesting, if, if the, the, the evolving city is to be planned in a reasonable way, then maybe what we need to do is to kind of organize for stakeholder participation so that the different voices in the city, wherever they are, can somehow have a say or at least participate in the debate on what kind of future city do we want. Now, if it then transpires that in Stockholm or in London, um, there's a general consensus that actually it is the car city that we want, but we want electric cars as opposed to car, you know carbon uh, em emitting cities, then well, that's something that needs to be then taken very, very seriously. You know, you can't have democracy and then not listen to it. Mm. What about the rest of you? How do you view the city of the future? I know it's a big topic, but that's why we're here. Andrew? Um, well, if I keep my comments maybe to, to the global south, I mean, there are a lot more, uh, there's a wider range of actors today in planning. I mean, the days of, I think, uh, is right, that the day of the heroic master planner is, is over. Um, you know, we're, we're looking at um, these actors who are filling the sort of the middle sphere there. For example, the, the classic case is this example of Shaktawalis International, which starts, started in South Africa and is now a global player. Um, it has affiliates in many different countries in Africa, basically trying to mobilise uh, people in informal areas to, through savings, through uh, through community almost to pool resources. Um, but even there, I had an interest, I've got a master's thesis came in today, which should be accepted for tomorrow, hopefully, where she's looked at these cases, and even there we see a, a, a becoming hegemony amongst Shaktawalas International, where if you're not a member of them, you're excluded from the planning process again, even though it's not from the state this time. So the, ten, the, the, the crux for me, at least, seems to be move away from these ideas of good intentions tending to coalesce into hegemony at the end of the day anyway. Uh, how do you keep things sort of radically open to difference and radically open to different, um, different people's views on the city? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Katya, future? Yeah. Um, yeah, it is a really tricky question. If you, we are kind of beyond, uh, beyond the grand visions, the grand... Uh, in terms of how it, how it should look, how it should be, you know, that's... I mean, it's what we work with more is these questions of processes of how and that they I mean how to how to counterbalance the the uh, very strong economic forces that are controlling that uh, that seem to always have the kind of the deciding uh, vote in almost anything and that does promote the affluent uh, members of society and does 
push uh, down uh, dialogue. So it's more. It's uh, so. So I, I have really difficult time asking uh, answering what the future city is in any terms. But I would really hope that the future city is a place where we have processes of planning that are really forcefully balancing and that are also taking not only the gender perspective that I talked about before and that we are working with the heart, but, but, but to, to take into account all these different power uh, balances, whose interests are, is developing, development happening for, and to, to always have that in. And I think that builds a good city in a very different uh, way. And to absolutely not in that give up on planning, but we're, it's a different kind of planning. We're going to take a Skype question uh, in a minute. So very briefly, Professor Men. Well, I want to say something in defense of modernism, mm -hmm. um, and very briefly. If you think about where urbanism is going today, and you mentioned this at the beginning, you know, we're moving toward unbelievably large urban complexes in, in which the the potential for inequality and injustice is going to be really quite catastrophic. Mm. And one of the things that modernism asked was, well, what is it that can be done um, at ground level which effectively begins to meet the, the needs of the more rather than the few? And in today's context, I think the city of the future, if you, if you scan around globally, if the city of the future doesn't have the basic infrastructures of life in place, you know, from transport through to connectivity, through to general kind of welfare uh, well-being, then I think we're in for a very, very bad time. And so I would say, as a kind of footnote to this discussion, that s something along the lines of the large-scale engineering of well-being mm -hmm. is, is, of, is of critical importance for future urbanism. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Let's see, do we have a question on Skype? Hello? Hello there. Hello. Who and where are you? Well, uh, my name is uh, Randy Shoei. I'm a PhD candidate at the Stockholm University, and uh, I have a question yeah. regarding city planning and uh, gender, and it's from a micro perspective. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I would like to bring up the phenomena uh, such as exclusive area for women, uh, which you can find in places such as swimming pools and uh, gyms. And uh, in terms of gender equality, I would like to know, uh, you know, as the phenomenon exists in both uh, religious countries, uh, theocracies and, such, and uh, Islamic countries as such, uh, and also in more so-called liberal kind of societies, such as in Sweden, how would the, expert, uh, the experts contrast this phenomenon between these two types of societies? Mm -hmm. Do they have different implications, different means, and what, what would they be? That's very interesting. Thank you for your question. So is, is the gender separated, gender separated spa spaces, are the implications different uh, in different types of societies? I guess what we're driving at here is that is th there's a sort of implicit idea here, I guess, that in certain kinds of con societies that separation would be about control. Is it also not that in a country like Sweden? Katja? Yes. I mean, I mean of course, I, I mean, I would say that in... in I mean, one of the things is you, that you really cannot understand such a thing in a very kind of generalistic way, that you have to really l think through what, it is, what, is, wh what does this mean in this context and in that context, and on what, who is uh, in what interests is this uh, separatist space defined, and what can happen in there, uh, and so forth. So I think it's, very, it's very, very, very difficult to try to even answer in a general way about the difference, like in, in terms of making a, a difference between in that culture that would mean this, and in this culture it means that. I think it's, it's a very important question, but it needs to be responded to in the specific context, what kind of boss culture it is, and what kind of empowerment it can give to have a very uh, separatist space in a, in a society or in a, in a context where you also feel that there is a, uh, where the gender division is, uh, where the power balance is, is of a very certain kind. That that is, so I, I don't think I really don't. I would not like to go into a kind of mm. more generalistic. Uh, uh, position on that, but, we can certainly, but it's important. We can certainly observe that, that, the, that the separate, separated space, whether on gender, uh, 
basis or something or some some other kind of grouping uh, is also a traditional strategy for for the less powerful group to have spaces exactly. to to convene and and to sp to speak in an in an uninterrupted manner and and to be safe together yes, as well I mean, for, so it, yes, it operates so in both directions the, um, knitting clubs or whatever it is that it is uh, the knitting is is just one one of the many things or a gardening uh, culture mm. that can be gender uh, specific or a be, uh, bathing culture uh, yeah. that it's uh, yeah andrew that's well, just a reflection i think i think this question of zoning is very interesting and i think I mean, it's been done um uh, subtly already for example in stockholm now where if you speak to the police you speak to the uh the uh, Stockholm city councillors, um, they, have a, they have a conscious policy of trying to zone the uh, rowdy youth into Tanta London. Um, you know, this is, a, this is a policy which is not you know, written anywhere, but it's a policy of containment. Um, I, I think that's a, a very problematic way to go. Mm. Absolutely. Did yes, that answer your question? Yeah. Mm. Yes, I'm, I'm thankful for the questions. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have a question from the audience here? Yes. Hi. Um, this is probably mostly for Andrew and uh, Amen. I, I'm interested what you think about the future of public transportation in the global south. Uh, are there many uh, metro systems being planned or uh, is it just uh, informal share taxis and that sort of thing? Uh, hmm? So, uh, And for the others as well, but maybe this is Andrew and Amen. This is very interesting. Who would like to start? Professor Amin? Yeah? Well, I, th I think the... Uh the, the general answer for the Global South is that the state of the infrastructure is a mess. Um, and even in those cities which are aspiring to become world class, and Nairobi is a typical example. I, I grew up in Nairobi. I went back to it 40 years later, and the traffic simply doesn't move. Um, but the more situated and nuanced answer is that in some parts of the world, and I think again, I think in Latin America, in, in, in particular, in, in in Bolivia, in Brazil, there are some really interesting experiments going on with infrastructure, not just through public transport, but things like high rail and monorail, um, ways of connecting up uh, slums uh, to the center of the city and to and to labor markets and. What's very, very interesting is that, is that a lot of these experiments are actually low cost. Mm -hmm. um, and they're not also working on the principle uh, that, that the transport will be free. Um, it, but, but the tariffs are affordable. So um, what, I, what, what I would say is that um, there are little green shoots uh, in, in, in the south, but they're, they're still very little and they are still mm -hmm. uh, beginning to become green. For me. I think that we could actually try to, to warn these kind of, of cities for the mistakes we have done. Um, I mean, every square meter that we devote to private cars is very hard to retain. And American evidence or experience shows that we have, we have car cities. And what I mean is that when we build more and more motorways and roads for private cars, the, the, the harder it will be to get the public transportation going. It becomes a shift, mm -hmm. and it's very hard to retain each, each square meter of private cars. That's yeah. the experience we have. It's true. So they have to start from the beginning. So very briefly, Andrew, we're running out of time. Yeah, very. I mean, I, I would question the idea that the transport is necessarily a mess. So I think under the uh, financial um, capabilities they have in these, it's amazing how well they do. I think sometimes that the transport still moves, but. Um, also, the political interest. I know that from the cases I've looked at, uh, the transport system is often very politically, uh, there's often many vested interests in the, in the uh, continuation of these kind of haphazard transport systems. So breaking those uh, political controls over that, that, that particular um, sector is difficult as well, I think. Yeah. I, we could talk about this all night, obviously, but we're going to have to end now. So I'm just going to take a very quick round and ask you a very difficult question indeed. Could you mention one city that you find inspiring, and, the, the, and which aspect it is you're referring to. What aspect of what city do you currently find inspiring? Uh, let's start with Tommy, you're smiling like you have an answer. Uh, no, my facial expression was the contrary. <laughs> um, I, don't, I, I, don't, I think I don't have a city in mind in particular, but I think there, 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 there are some examples in which cities have been, been trying to 
to to broaden the dialogue between different parties in the city and so mm. on. And and through that actually have take hold quite strongly on social injustice and, and environmental um, environmental issues. And also I would like to say that that you know we we talk a lot about urbanization in cities here and the, the future of the city. The future of the city does also contain what we see mm. about the rule of the countryside. Mm. Is that yeah. the tearing part or the wearing part? I mean I'm so, sorry, so sorry, we're running out of time. We yep. do have to. <laughs> Is it? Okay, okay. Everybody else gets like a three word answer now. Katja. Uh, oh, God. I think, uh, okay, I will say Berlin uh, mm -hmm. because I think, for in terms of uh, the position in relation to Swedish planning and what's happening in our cities, Berlin is very close, but it's very different. And I think it's also because of the different economic realities mm -hmm. of these cities that a lot of interesting initiatives. And Andrew? Uh, I would say Stockholm, but I think it's time the politi politicians got their act in order and started sorting out segregation in the city. Yes. Mm -hmm. And Ashamin? I would say Kigali in Rwanda. Its green credentials after the atrocities are very, very good. Thank you very much. Thanks ever so much to all of you. Andrew Byerly, Katja Grillner, Tom Jensen and Ashamin. We will be back on the hour with Space Travel. <laughs>